Okay, today we're going to be covering Iglesias. So let's turn to Iglesias. <clears throat> um, just like Proverbs, Iglesias is also uh, written by Solomon. And Solomon... Um, actually wrote this almost at the uh, end of his life it's uh it seems like the you know before or or as he closes chapters uh, literally he just actually shared this um this knowledge that he learned over uh over his life then he wanted to actually share it and wanted to tell the world about what he experienced so Solomon wrote three books, um, Proverbs, Iglesias, and Song of Songs. Um, we think that Song of Songs was written when he was younger age, and the Proverbs were written uh, during his uh, um, kind of... Uh, is a middle life, and the Ecclesiastes was written, you know, a later um, part of his life. So it is very, very important, and especially for for us to understand exactly what Solomon is trying to share. This is the lifelong journey. That he he experienced, and he wanted to really just to share what he experienced, and it is definitely a worthwhile to really just understand exactly what he's saying. There are a few things that he actually mentioned, which is the key uh, keyword or the key topics of Iglesias. Um, When you actually look at the Ecclesiastes, um, he mentions vanity. Vanity is a some things that he's been keep repeating. In other words, that he repeats in this book is um, he just keeps saying. Um, under the sun. Those are the two keywords he just keep repeating in this book. Under the sun. What it means is that under the suns, what he has experienced, what he has seen, and and speak about everything what he had done and experienced is really vanity. And then we're going to just really go through this uh, book and, and we're going to really understand exactly what he experienced and what he wanted to share. Um, sometimes, actually, when I talk to uh, my daughters, I just try to share my experience. My experience is only, you know, very um, limited, but at least... I want to let them know what I experienced, what I did good, what I have done wrong, so they don't repeat the same mistake that I made. Even the history is really just uh, teaches us, you know, how humans been behave over the years, what we have done right and what we have done wrong. But not many people really pay attention to a uh, history. History teaches us a lot because human really doesn't change. We've been actually repeating the same things on over and over and people just don't learn from history. People actually leave this history so that the people understand and know and learn from the history. That's why people write the history, but unfortunately, we just 
don't seem to have much of interest interest in history. So therefore, we make the same mistake that our ancestors made or the people of old had made. And we just keep repeating and doing it over and over and over again. It is very unfortunate. Of course, there are people do learn things from history, but compared to the people who doesn't care about the history, um, it's very little. And we want to really just learn the experience from the people who already gone through the, uh, their life. So it is important for us to even hear and listen to the people who lived a long life and listen to and gain your experiences. I don't have to make the same mistake they made or I don't have to walk the path that they actually walked. I should know which path I should walk and which path I should avoid. But most of the younger generations, they just don't listen to the older people or experience the people because they think they know everything. They just do things you know, based on what they know and what they what they just um, a feel. And when I think about it, I did the same thing. I did not know that I should really pay attention to those people. And sometimes we also read the books. We we gain the experience from people that we don't know, which helps us to really think and helps us to really just you know to live a better life. But unfortunately, once again. Not many people pay attention to what others has to say. And this Ecclesiastes is a very, very important book as well. And I really want to just to emphasize that every Christian should really pay attention to Ecclesiastes to really learn the lessons and, uh, you know, what Solomon really had said and how this teachings that he's giving us really impact our spirit, uh, teaches us how to live a better spiritual life. And I really want everyone to really pay attention to this uh, book, but at the same time, not only just that we're going through and read this book, but at the same time, I strongly recommend for you guys to really also uh, pay attention to and, and read this on, a, on your you know separate spare time let's just uh, jump right into Ecclesiastes um, let's jump to a chapter 1 the words of the preacher the son of David king in Jerusalem vanity of vanities says the preacher vanity of vanities all is vanity what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun. A generation goes and generations come, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hasten to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the, uh, to the north. Around and around goes the wind, a wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ears are filled with hearing. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of a former things, nor will there be any remembrance of a late, a later things yet to be among those who come after. So let's just talk about this uh, Ecclesiastes. The Ecclesiastes means literally the preachers or the uh, collector of 
of the sentence. Um, it's called in Hebrew word Kohelet. So the words of the preacher, the son of David and king in Jerusalem. So instead of a saying the Solomon, instead of he identify himself, he says the son of David, the king in Jerusalem. So he's teaching based on what he has experienced. And he says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanity. All is vanity. One thing that we have to be a little careful as we read this book is that many people only read a few chapters of Ecclesias and they think this book really just preaches about uh, nihilism. It's not about nihilism. Life is nothing. That's not what this book is really teaches us. Of course, we have to really get to the end of exactly what this preacher or the Solomon is really just teaching us at the end. But he also mentioned throughout the book and he just hinted us exactly why he's writing this and what's the purpose. There's a few things that we need to be able to distinguish. Solomon has really gifted by God and he received the wisdom. And as we go through Psalms and Proverbs, we learned about wisdom. What is the true wisdom is? As I mentioned, there are different kinds of wisdom. The wisdoms from this world, that's the one part of the wisdom. Another part of the wisdom is the part of wisdom from God, which references Jesus Christ. What Solomon has received, it is really not the, the wisdom that the Bible is really talking about. So when we actually go to um, 1 Kings, when we go to 1 Kings chapter 3, let's just go to the part where he actually prayed. 1 Kings chapter 3, We're going to read from verse 4. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offering on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have a shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, in uprightness of a heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father, although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen. A great people, too many to be numbered or accounted for multitude. Give your servant before an understanding mind to govern your people and that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, uh, your great people? He pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, and God's had, uh, God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself a long life, or riches, or the life of your etern uh, enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word, behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you have been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you 
also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you. All your days, and if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statue and my commitments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and placed uh, peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. This is very important for us to really just understand this. What did Solomon really ask for? When you pay attention to exactly what he asked for, going back to verse 9 is what he really asked for. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this your great people? What did he really ask for? He asked for the understanding mind to govern his people. Which means, I want to properly rule the country of your people. So what he really asked for is not the really spiritual discernment or understanding or wisdom, but ability to really govern his own people to really judge his own people with what is good and what is evil as a king. So this wisdom or the understanding or the uh, understanding mind that is referencing, it is not about the really just how this Bible really teaches about the wisdom. This is the different wisdom. This wisdom he asked for was just to really govern the God's people and judge people based on what is good and evil. So, don't get mixed up with the wisdom that he had. Many people really think that Solomon had the wisdom of God and wisdom of God that actually just how to worship the Lord better. No, it's a different wisdom that he had. The wisdom that he asked for was just to govern the God's people. So it's a, it's a different types of wisdom. Of course, it's the wisdom was better than any other kings before or after him. But the wisdom that he asked for was a very different type of wisdom than the, what Bible is really talking about. So verse 12 says, Behold, I now do according to your words. So God is giving him the wisdom to rule his own people and judge based on good and evil based on the law so god just gave him what he asked for and and also in addition god also allowed him to have riches honors and other things so understanding this particular part of this uh, solomon's ask or his request is a very important in order for us to really understand the ecclesias After he received this wisdom from God and understanding mind that he received from God, and he really enjoyed everything what God has given him. So he had the riches. He had the wisdom to rule his people with honor. And he had lots of women. And he really enjoyed the territories. And he really just enjoyed everything what a man could desire. After he had everything, after he really enjoyed it, now he come to the end of his life and he looking back his life and what he learned, what he experienced is what he's really sharing. After he had everything, enjoyed everything, and this is his conclusion. His conclusion is the vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. So that, what is a vanity? The Bible actually says vanity, but this is really Hebel. Hebel is vapor. 
Like when you actually boil the water and the vapor starts to come up, right? And that's really vanity. So it's like vapor. It just comes up, but it's, it's nothing. It's just like fog. There's nothing more than that. And the word that he used in this vanity is Hebel. So what is a Hebel? Hebel is, as I mentioned, is just emptiness. Breath is just vapor. It's just nothing. You cannot really hold anything. Who would actually just chase, chase after the vapor and wants to possess the vapor? Nobody. And from his perspective, vanity, which means is nothing at all. One thing we can actually keep in mind here is, as I mentioned, vanity is Hebel. Hebel. That reminds of us something. What really reminds us of Hebel is this. When we actually go back to Genesis. When we go back to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4 says this, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was the keeper of a sheep, and Cain, a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you, so, uh, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contra uh, contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has to open its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. So we see the story of Cain and Abel. This Abel really coming from Habel. Habel, which we just talked about. Vapor. It's nothing. What is man? As I mentioned, we are dust of the earth. We're nothing but vapor. Hebel. We're nothing. We're nobody. We think we have something. And kings may say, well, I have power. I have wealth. I have honor. The king, especially Solomon, could speak up and say, well, I had everything, I enjoyed everything, because he did. But he realized at the end of his life, what I enjoyed, whatever I had, is Hebel. It was nothing. But here's the part. People like us, we did not have, or we don't have what Solomon had. We never possessed honor, power, and wealth. Everything what he enjoyed, we never enjoyed it. Since we have not had those type of 
luxury. We want to have it. We want to have a power. We want to have honor. We want to have wealth. We want to have everything what Solomon had. And we're thinking all that will bring us joy and happiness. And the confessions coming from Solomon, who had everything, is saying, vanity of a vanity. There's nothing. I, en- I had it everything. I enjoyed everything. And come to the end of my life, now I know it is nothing. It's empty. He's actually just want to share this knowledge and experience with us. But how many people really get these ideas or learn the lessons from this wise man? Unfortunately, not many. People still look for what Solomon had. But he confessed, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. It's nothing. What does does a man gain by all the toil. Once again, I'm just going to pay attention to the word that he uses, toil. Throughout the entire book of Ecclesiastes, the toil is going to be very, very important words that we're going to really just talk about. And I'm going to get to that uh, later on. But just to keep that in mind, toil is a something that he keep repeats. And it is an important topic that we need to talk about. What does man gain by all the toil? So what it means is that whatever we really worked, whatever actually we spent to gain is is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? So under the sun, we worked very hard to gain the wealth, power, honor all these good things we worked the very hard for it if you don't work hard you don't get it we worked very hard to get it of course for solomon's he was blessed a lot of things was given to him but at the same time that does not mean he didn't do anything he of course he worked very hard to maintain it and keep it as well And he exercised the wisdom that he received from God and continued to utilize those things to really just maintain the blessings that he has received. A generation goes and generations come, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where where it rises. So, does the sun comes up on the east and sets on the west. It happened at the time of Solomon and even before. And it's been like that and even today and will be tomorrow. It doesn't change. It's still the same exact things. The nature does not change. Whatever God sets, he created the earth and then created the natures. The sun will come up on the east and sets on the west. That happens every day. And we see that. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. So wind blows to the the north and the south and east and west. Around and round goes the wind. And on its circuits, the wind returns. So wind goes and wind comes. All streams run, run to the sea but the sea is not full to the place where the stream f- streams of flow. There they flow again. All things are full of awareness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear fills with hearing. So, for us, we never stop seeing things. We continue to see things. When we see more, we crave before more. Our desire comes from by seeing it. Imagine when we actually go and see something, we desire more. We want to see more. Not only that, 
We want to hear more. It never stops. We want to know more, which means our soul always desired to see more and hear more. Important part is just like our flesh, our body crave for food. So we eat. When we get hungry, we eat. At least we eat three times a day. Sometimes the people eat once or twice. But mostly people eat three times a day. We get hungry, we eat. Is that enough? No, the next day comes, we repeat. We eat in the morning, we eat in the, you know, in the afternoon, we eat at the evening hours. We eat. Does it stop? No, it doesn't stop. As long as we live, we continue to eat because our flesh desires food. Not only our flesh, but also our soul. Does our soul get hungry? Absolutely. Our soul gets hungry. We want to see more. We want to hear more. We want to gain the knowledge. We want to just experience more things. That's why people read, see, enjoy. This never stops. Our desire never stops. It's just not a one-day thing. It's every day of our life we actually experience this. Well, important thing is, as I mentioned, why people just watch this type of YouTube or social media? Why are you seeing those? Why are you watching all this? Mm. We never stop. Sometimes we actually, people go to TikTok or just a YouTube short, you know, they just keep flipping, flipping, flipping. It's not enough. It's so fun. Keep watching. Flipping more. Never stops. This is who we are. Our flesh, our soul, never stops. It is a happening just for you? No. It happens to everybody. The whole world is in it. Was it like this just today? For our own generation? No. Even in the past, there was no phone, there's no YouTube, but same thing happened in the past. What about the ancient days? Same thing. It's just different types. But human, man always desired to see more, hear more. That didn't change. And do you think it will change in the future? No, it doesn't. In the past and present and the future, it will always be like that. Just like the sun comes up, sets, wind blows from one side and goes another, and comes around, goes around, water goes in and out, water flows out to the sea, goes up to the sky, cloud, and then brings the rain down to the earth. So it just repeats itself. It's, it literally all goes and comes around. So this is how everything is. So when you take a look at this, all things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ears are filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. So what he's saying is, it's always be, the, it's always be like this. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of a former things, nor will there be any remembrance of a la uh, later things yet to be among those who come after. So as I mentioned, under the sun, it's the same things repeats itself. Everything has always been like that, and all it's been like this today, and it will be like that in the future. Nothing changes. Has that... Man lived like this 
forever? Yes. From the day of Adam, it never changed. Under the sun, there's nothing new. We may say, oh, this is something new. Like, for example, even fashion, right? When you actually look around, fashion seems to be like changing every year. The color changes every year. But when you think about it, it's just literally just same thing and over and over again. Trend is the same thing. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired a great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I, I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom, in much vexations, and he who increase knowledge increase sorrow. When you look, everything what we desire, what we see, what we hear, is nothing more than a, just a chasing after wind. If you see someone who's trying to capture the wind, who's trying to just ch chase after winds and possess it, we may say, what are you doing? We may think that the person is just like crazy. But you know what? What we desire is just like chasing after wind and want to possess it. Solomon is saying, I have done this. I chase after wind. I try to just to gain more wisdom. More wealth. Everything I wanted it, I try to gain everything. But I realize this is like chasing after wind. So, he is the one who actually gone through all this and realized this is nothing. We just don't know where the wind comes from, where the wind goes. Does anyone care? No. It just comes and goes. Nobody really pay attention when the wind goes, uh, when comes, and when, you know, where the wind goes. And verse 16 says, I said in my heart, I have acquired a great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. So, he says, I have gotten enormous amount of wisdom. I had more wisdom and knowledge than the people, people before me, even after me. But, this is like vanity. And he said, I applied my heart to know wisdom and to no madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after wind. So he realized gaining wisdom, gaining knowledge, possessing wealth, everything what I tried and lived for is nothing more than a vanity. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was a vanity. I said of laugh, laughter, it is mad and of pleasure. What use is it? 
I search with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven under the few days of their life. I made great works. I built the houses and planted vineyard for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit tree, trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had the slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks more than any who had been there uh, who has uh, who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gather for myself a silver and gold and a treasure of a kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of men. Well, isn't this what we desire? Isn't this what the man desire? More wealth. And he even had a parks, vineyards, slaves. He just grew the plants and fruits. He made his choir team let people sing for him. He gained the wisdom. He did everything what a man could ever desire. But what is he saying? I have done all this. It's a vanity. When you actually listen to the people who are at very old age, when you ask them, what are the things that you actually regret in your life? Not many people say, oh, I, wanted, I should have made more money. That's not what people regret for. People regret for different things. When you listen to the many of the people, the wise people, people talk about the completely different things because they have gone through those life, experienced those, and realize that what we desire throughout all our life is nothing. They just realize after they chased it for many, many years, they realize that this is nothing. I was chasing after wins. Ho hopefully, we want to get this idea, but unfortunately, it doesn't stick in our head. Yeah, 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 I get it. Yeah, I understand. I, I read it. I heard about it. But that's it. It doesn't really touch their soul at all. Because we continue to desire same thing what everyone in the past have desired. We repeat the same mistake that they made. We think all these Solomon had enjoyed will bring joy and happiness in our life. But unfortunately, no. So, verse 9 I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desire, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all uh, my toil." Then I consider all that my hands had done and the toil that I had expend, uh, expending in doing it. And behold, I uh, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Remember two words that I just kept mentioning? This book continues to repeat. Toil and under the sun. Under the sun, every man desired the same thing. It is not just Solomon who desired it, but every man on earth desired this. What they see, what they hear, what they want to possess, it never stops. Our desire never stops. 
We think that if we didn't have anything, we just want for something small. Oh, I wish I had this. Once you have this, you desire more. Our grudge never stops. It just continues to grow bigger and more. That's exactly what man's desire. But what is he saying? Everything I had, everything that I really enjoyed, verse 11 says, I consider all that my hands had done and the toil I had expending in doing it, and behold, all was a vanity and striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. But you know what? I tell you this. All of us will still desire it. Yeah, 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 I understand, but I want it anyway. When you actually just go to Second Corinthians chapter 4, Second Corinthians chapter 4, starting from verse 16. So, we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed by, day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are sent, uh, seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. What we desire, what we want, is what we can see, what we can possess, what we can touch, what we desired is what we can see, but what we don't focus is unseen. The things that we cannot see, our spirit. We're not focusing on the things we cannot see, but rather we focus on the things that we can see, touch, and possess. Coming back to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 12. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can, be, uh, can the man do who comes after the kings? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceived that the same event happens to, happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I, have, uh, I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For the wise, as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance of seeing that in the days to come all will have been, have been forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool, so I hated life, because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is a vanity and striving after wind. Once again, whether wise or folly, I just like chase after things to be wise and do things wise. And verse 14 says, there, the wise person has his eyes and the head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I per perceive that the same event happens to all of them. So, yes, wise person has wisdom in his head. Foolish people does not. 
But what's the difference? And verse 15 says, Then I said in my heart, What happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? In life, whether you're wise or fool, same thing happens to the man. We all die. The, does the life end differently for the fool and wise? No. End of life comes to either wise or fool. Doesn't really matter. It comes to all. In verse 16, at the end, it says, How the wise dies just like the fool. It's the same thing. Everyone dies. Whether you're wise or fool, we all die. And verse 17 says, So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is a vanity and a striving after wind. So, everything in life is literally vanity. Nothing more, nothing less. Whether it happens to wise or fool, the death comes to everyone. So, it sounds like what Bible really teaches us, nihilism, nothing. Means it means nothing at all. And for those of the people who are actually just can actually see or read the Chinese, and I'll just post this on the chat. For those of the people, possibly Amy and uh, Wei, I'm just going to post it on the chat. You would understand what this is, right? This means what? The life is meaningless. Life is empty. You know where this teaching coming from? It's of course is coming from all Chinese. All Asians speaks about this. Life We feel like there's no meaning to the life. If this a Bible teaches Bible teaches us a different things. As I mentioned, Bible does not teach us nihilism. Bible is not saying life is meaningless, nothing. Life is meaningful things. God given us a life. Certainly, this book teaches us a completely different than nihilism or the things that I just wrote on the chat. One thing that we need to keep in mind here is this Ecclesias is limited in the Old Testament. It doesn't talk about the new life different life it does not talk about the new testament it only talks about old testament old testaments only see everything what we do everything what we toil is meaningless but of course he just talks about all these things to get to the real points at the end but let's continue to walk through exactly what he's saying verse 18 says i hated all my toil in which i toiled under the sun seeing that i must leave it to the man who will come after me and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool yet he will be master of all for which i toiled and use my wisdom under the sun. This also is a vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toils of my labor under the sun, because 
Sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by some、uh, someone who did not toil for it. This also is a vanity, and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with,、uh, with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of a sorrow. And his work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This also is a vanity. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have an enjoyment? For two who The one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is a vanity and striving after wind. Let's talk about this for a moment. I mentioned Solomon talks about under the sun what he toiled. Is nothing, is a vanity. So let's just take a look at it once again. I hate it, all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me, and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he will be a master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This is also vanity. So, He actually gained all this wisdom and write this and then leave it to the people who come after me. And I'm sure they will learn something. I don't know whether they'll be wise or full, but I'm leaving this so that everyone can learn from it. But you know what? This is also vanity. So then w e thinking, saying, why should he actually even leave this document if no one's going to learn from it? Verse 20 says, So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toils of my labor under the sun. And I want to talk about this for a moment. So, everything what he toiled under the sun, s whatever actually he worked very hard for it, was just nothing. More than a chasing after a wind. So, what is he saying then? Is that means we shouldn't do anything or we should not just like, we just give it up? No, unfortunately, that's not what he's really teaching us. He's actually teaching us completely different things. So, then what is he really teaching us? So, We have to pay attention to what is he saying. Verse 20 is very important. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labor under the sun. So what is he saying? All the toil of my labors under the sun. This toil in Hebrew word, Is Amar. Amar is a literally toil. Verse 20 says, All the toil of my labors under the sun. So, under the sun, everything what he worked very hard for it is what he's saying. It's all vanity. So, then, what does it really remind of us? It reminds us something very important. We might have actually forgot, even though we have actually covered this a long ago. But let's just remind ourselves of what we actually talked about in the past. I want you to turn to Exodus for a second. Exodus chapter 17.
Exodus chapter 17. We're going to read from verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek. While Moses, Aaron, and Herod went up to the top of the hill, whenever Moses had held up his hand, Israel prevailed, and whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hand grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. While Aaron and Herod held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, so his hands were steady until going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in the book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have a war with Amalek from generation to generation. We know this story very well. How Joshua actually fought against the uh, Amalekite. And then, when Joshua and his people fought with Amalekite, Moses went up to the hill with Aaron and Hur. And when Moses held up his staff, Joshua won the battle. When his staff comes down because his you know, hands were become tired and weird, weird, uh, weird then Amalekai prevailed. So her and Aaron helped Moses to lift up his staff on the both sides. Left and right. When they actually helped the Moses to hold up their hands, then Israel won the battle. So I understand that actually this, this happened, but there are a few things that we need to keep in mind. First of all, what does a staff have to do with this battle? What is the relationship between the Joshua and his people, you know, just battling against the Amalekite versus Moses holding up the staff? One of the important things that the book says in verse 9, it says, choose for, choose for us men and go out and fight with uh, Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. What kind of staff? Staff of God. Staff of God. Remember, when you actually go back to the previous chapters, when God told Moses, go and actually just go to my people and deliver my people out of Egypt. And he said, oh, oh, oh no, 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 I, I, can't, I can't go. And God actually showed him a miracle. And God asked Moses, what are you holding on your hands? Oh, this is Steph. As I mentioned, who is Moses right now? Is he a prince? He was a prince in Egypt. When God called Moses, he was not prince at all. What was it? What, what, what was he doing? He was a shepherd. He was a lonely shepherd. He was taking care of sheep and cattle. When God asked him, what are you holding your hands? Moses has been a shepherd for 40 years. Where? Where, where was he actually doing this, you know, taking care of the sheep? Median. Right? He ran to the Median. He was living with the Medianites. 
So he was literally taking care of his sheep and cattle in the wilderness for 40 years. What does this staff mean to shepherd? To shepherd, that's everything. Because staff is something that he uses taking care of the sheep and cattle when they don't listen and use the staff to really guide those the sheep. But at the same time, the staff is used to drive out wild animals to protect the sheep and cattle and then also when he becomes tired when he becomes weary staff it is something that he hold on to and rest so the staff is a very very important part of a shepherd's life it's like soldier with gun if the soldier does not have a gun then he cannot fight Soldier cannot fight without weapon. To shepherd, staff is very important. So no matter where he went, when he was taking care of the sheep and cattle, he had to carry the staff. So the staff, something that he's been holding, and he's been carrying it for 40 years, no matter where he went, he was always carrying that staff. That's exactly what God was asking for. What is in your hand? Well, then let's think about it for a second. God does not know what the staff is for. Why is he asking? Is that because God does not understand exactly what the meaning of the staff of the shepherd? God knows. This is what, why God asked Moses. What are you holding on your hands? Oh, this is a staff. What does God tell him to do? Throw your staff. When he threw that staff, it became a snake. What did he find? Moses is a shepherd. He's been using the staff all his life. And this is something he's been holding on to. And it, it, the staff, it is part of his life. When he was letting go of the staff, he realized that the staff is a serpent that he was relying on. He was, he's been carrying this on. He realized this was a serpent. And God let him see this. The staff that has been you've been relying on, you've been attached to, has been serpent. And when he threw that out, he realized that that was a serpent. And God told him, now, now you saw what it is, now hold back. When he actually hold the tail of that snake, what happened? He became a staff again. When he was holding this staff before he threw onto the ground, it was Moses' staff. It was Moses' staff. But when he threw and then grabbed it back, it no longer was Moses' staff. After that miracle, it became the staff of God, which is exactly what he was holding. What was he holding? It says, I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. It was a God's staff. And he was holding on to it. War belongs to God. Not belongs to Moses. Not belongs to Joshua. Not belongs to anybody. But the winning or losing of a war, it, it, it was up to God. When he was lifting up the staff, Joshua and Israel was winning. When the staff was coming down, and Malachi was winning. So what happened? Since the Hur and Aaron was helping the Moses to holding up the staff, obviously 
Joshua won the battle. Great! Joshua won the battle. Great! So then, after he winning the battle, now the other parts of the verse coming in, which is kind of weird, kind of like strange the way that God is saying. Let's just read it one more time. Verse 13 and on. And Joshua overwhelmed and Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in the book and recite it in the, uh, in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under the sun, uh, under the heaven. So under the heaven, literally under the sun, and Moses built an altar and called the name of it. The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generations. What he's saying is, I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under the heaven. According to the scriptures, there are so many countries that Israel fought against. Philistines, Edomites, right? Also, many other countries, surrounding countries. There are so many countries who attacked and destroyed Israel. Assyrians, Babylonians, Arameans. But you know what? God never said anything to those countries. Even Egypt. God never said what he said about Amalekite. Strange. Why God is just saying about Amalekite that he's going to blot out the Amalekites? Why only Amalekite? There are so many other countries, so many actually people fought against Israel. But God never said anything about those people at all. But it's a very, very interesting point that God just kind of point out this particular Amalekite. And then I'm going to um, blot out under the heaven. People may not pay attention to this. But this is a very, very important things to remember. Why? Because this is related to what we're just reading about. Once again, the toil. What is the word in Hebrew toil? Amal. Amal. Hmm. Sounds like a Malachite. Amal is literally toil. This is what Solomon is saying. Once again, going back to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2 again. Verse 20. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labor under the sun. What it means is, everything that we actually toil with my own labor under the sun, God is going to blot out. What does that mean? This is what we say. I worked very hard for everything that I possess. My knowledge, understanding, wealth, friends, honor, fame, you name it. Everything that you possess today. Your house. Everything what you have in your house. Didn't you work very hard to gain it? To possess it? Yes, of course. You worked very hard. You went to school. You got the, you know, the knowledge and wisdom. You worked very hard to make money, to buy a house. Or houses. You worked very hard for everything what you have in your house. You all spend 
good amount of time and your effort to really gain what you have. The problem is people trusting what they have. I have everything because I worked hard. As if you did everything on your own. Your power, your wisdom, your knowledge, your time. I worked very hard. I'm trusting myself that I actually did what, what I did. For those of the people who actually think they gain all this with their own power and their own knowledge and wisdom and their work, you would never need God. There is no room for God at all. Where does God, what does God do for you? Because you can do everything but on your own. You're trusting yourself, your own knowledge, your own wisdom. You believe in yourself. When you started to believe in yourself, and that is exactly what the Solomon is saying. What is it? All the toil of my labors under the sun. We think that we can do everything on, on our own. If you can do everything on your own, there's nothing God can do for you. Can we take care of ourselves? We say, yes, I can. Can I do everything? If I actually put my mind to it, if I put time and effort to it, yes, I can. What does this world teaches us? Believe in yourself, you can do it. That's exactly what we learn from this world. Believe in yourself, you can do it. Bible teaches us completely different. No, you cannot. You need Jesus. Once again, going back to the story, when Moses actually drove the Israel out of Egypt, when they came out to the wilderness, when they were in Egypt, they worked. Even though they were slaves, they were making bricks, they worked very hard to gain the food place they lived they worked to gain what they need in Egypt when they came out of Egypt and when they're in the wilderness there's no work they can do so therefore they had to rely on God to provide the food and waters When God told them, you go out and get this manna, they actually went out, gather more than what they were told to gather. God told them, go out, bring your daily bread. But they just went out and they collected more than a daily bread. They just saved for tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and a few days worth of food and manna brought back. But what they realized that whatever they accumulate more than a daily bread, they could not eat. So they have to come to collect this manna every day. Wow. It's tired to go out every day to gather this manna. I don't want to do it. I want to just accumulate and keep it in my tent for, for a few days so I don't have to go out, go out every day. I'm too tired. But God would not allow them to. You come and grab a daily bread. Every day you come to me. What is actually Bible teaches us? Come to me. But we refuse to come to the Lord. We want to help ourselves. I'll come to you whenever I need. I don't want to come to you every day. When I need your help, I will come. So wait for me when I come to you. The rest of the day, I can take care of myself. That's not what God 
is telling us. You come to me. When Jesus was sitting with all this 5,000 people and a child had five bread, two fishes, Jesus told Philip, hey, you give food what they need. <laughs> Lord, what are you talking about? I can't give the bread to all these people. There are thousands of them. No way that I can actually get the bread for them. And when they actually brought this bread and fish, what did Jesus say? Bring it to me. Bring it to me. When they brought this a small amount of food, five bread and two fishes, when they brought to Jesus the small amount of food became the amount of food that 5,000 and more everyone was able to eat. What is he saying? God is teaching us come to me. How often? Every day. But we're too tired. Oh, I don't want to come to Jesus every day. I'm too tired. That is a saying, thinking of a people in the wilderness. I'm too tired to go out. If you're too tired to go out and bring the daily bread, then you'll be starved because there's no manna for you to eat. Yes. You can skip, but if you skip, you'll be starved. Bible is te teaching us, come to me every day. Don't trust yourself, but know who I am. Know who you are. Who you are is dust of the earth. What you toil under the sun is a vanity. Come to me. Daily, daily basis. But how many people does not know this? Everyone knows this. But is that what we do? But that's not what we do. We understand we know it, but we don't do it. So knowing is not doing it. Even people who commit crime it's not like they don't know what they're doing wrong they do know what they do is wrong but they still do it anyway knowing is not doing it bible is teaching us come to me i'm going to blot out toil of your labor under the sun i will blot it out why? So that you can come to me. That's exactly what this section is telling us. The toil under the sun. Mm -mm. It's like vanity. Don't trust what, the to what you toil under the sun. Because it is vanity and it's like chasing after wind. It's nothing. This is why he says, once again, verse 26, For to the one who pleases him, God has a given wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who please, pleases God. This also is vanity and striving after wind. One of the things that we have to keep in mind, everything under the sun, what we toil and gain is meaningless. But once again, keep in mind, this is a focus is on Old Testament. does not cover New Testament yet. So this is only limited to the Old Testament. 
Chapter 3. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under, under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, time to plant, and a time to plug up what is planted, a time to kill, and time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and time to laugh, a time to moan, and time to dance, uh, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stone together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, time to seek, a time to lose, a time to keep, and time to cast away, time to tear, time to saw, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and time to hate, a time to war, and a time for peace. In our life, there are times when you look at our life and everyone should know by now, not always sad, not always happy. In our life, there's ups and downs. Sometimes there are good times, there are sad times. Sometimes there are painful times. Life is like a roller coaster, ups and downs. It's never always up, never always down, never always a stay. It's ups and downs all the time. There are time for everything. This is something we have to realize. God allow us to really just have this. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. Yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceived that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do uh, good as long as they lived. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all he, uh, his toil. This is God's gift to man. God blessed us. God granted us to possess. While we have it, we should enjoy it. This does not mean you give up everything what you have and then just like, you know, go back to the nature. That's not what God is teaching us. Of course not. God bless us. God give us some things. If you're big, God give you big. If you're small, God give you a small. Who determines it? God determines it. People who should have a wealth, you will have a wealth. People who should not have a wealth, you will not have a wealth. God granted us. When God gives us, we should enjoy it. So, verse 12 is very important. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good and as long as they live. So what should we do about the things that God given to us? To do good and enjoy. Not do evil, to do good, help people, and also enjoy with them for the blessing God has given to us. Not to just to keep it for yourself and then just, you know, it's like dug up your own ground and then just to store it up in, you know, in your barn. No, you should just enjoy it. The concept and a principle of God is when you actually spend it, God fills it back and more. But we're afraid. We hold on to it. We don't want to give. We just want to hold it tight. That's not how God's system works. One of the things that we have to understand here is why did God give us a work to do? After Adam was dismissed from Garden of Eden, he was just eating fruit from the, the Garden of Eden. He did not have to work. There was no toiling. He did not saw seed or anything like that. There's no harvest. There's nothing. It was everything was a growing up in the Garden of Eden. He was just enjoying it. But after he was expelled from the Garden of Eden, 
What was the first thing that God gave it to Adam? You have to work all the days of your life. So what did Adam do? Adam had to work. He had to toil the ground. That was the first thing he had to do. For how long? All his life. Then what did actually Adam learn? While he was actually just work the ground, while he was a toiling, what he saw was dust. What he saw was this. You are nothing more than a dust of the earth. That's exactly what God taught Mo Adam. Look who you are. Rest of your life, this is what you will see. So that's exactly what Adam saw. For 900 some odd years, he's been working. And he worked very hard for it. To learn who you are. And learn who I am. So, God gave Adam to work to understand who you are and who God is so that you can come to God and ask for it. From the time of Adam until now and for our generations to come, we all work. We all work. What do we learn by working? Are we learning who we are and are we learning who God is? No, that's not what we're learning. God gave us a job and work to do because God teaches us who we are and God teaches us who God is so that we can fear the Lord. That's the whole purpose of why God gave us a work and job. But that's not what we're learning anymore. By working hard, we forgot about God. We forgot about who we are, which is completely different than what God actually intended to do. God gave us a work and job to know who we are and who God is so we can fear the Lord. It was actually a whole purpose and intention. But by working hard, we completely forgot about God. We no longer thinking about God. We no longer thinking about ourselves. We just work very hard to gain our wisdom, knowledge, possessions, wealth, whatever we see, whatever we hear, we want to just to gain more and more. That's what we work for. We forgot about God by working. We're too busy to even thinking about God. We have no time to think about God. That's exactly what happened. And you can think about yourself. Do we actually think about God as we work? Or well, we don't think about God as we work. We don't think about it as we work. We're just busy. Meeting after meetings, things to prepare. We're just busy. We don't have time to think about God. But God is just reminding us. That is a vanity. That is just like chasing after wind this is why many people after they retire they feel empty they work for like 30 40 50 years in their life they work very hard to go up to the place where they were where they grew their business after they retire they have nothing to do they feel empty what did i live for they start to think about life because they're no longer working. Solomon is leaving us wisdom and teaching us. I have done all this and this is my conclusions. And I'm leaving this with you so that you learn from me. But unfortunately, we don't learn from Solomon. But no matter whether we learn or not, God actually left this message with us. So that you can at least 
to read and understand. Verse 14 is literally the conclusion. I perceive that whatever God does endure forever, nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. This is the whole conclusion. This, this is the conclusion of the Ecclesiastes. So, whatever we do, it's just like chasing after wind. It is a vanity. But you know what? I perceive that whatever does endure forever, nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. If you don't get this, then you're not getting it. So, we actually go to Hebrew chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says this. And just as it is appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Okay, however you live in this life, whether you live foolish life or wise life, as I mentioned, death comes to all. Whether you're wise or fool, the death will come to you. And after you die, what comes? The judgment will come. Whether you like it or not, whether you understood it or not, whether you believe it or not, it doesn't matter. But I will tell you, the judgment will come. So know what's coming. Coming back to Galatians chapter 15 says, That which is already has been, that which is to be, already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness, and in place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is time for every matter and for every work. This is exactly what I just mentioned in Hebrew chapter 9, verse 27. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them, that they may see that they themselves are but beast. <laughs> what are we? We're nothing more than a beast. We're like animal. There's no difference. He says, For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast in the, uh, is the same. As one dies, so dies others. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go one place, are all, uh, all are from the dust, and to dust all return. This is what the Bible is teaching us. What are we? Dust. We came from dust, we go back to dust. So what is it? We are dust. That's exactly what God taught Adam and the people come after Adam. Who are you? You are dust of the earth. What can dust of the earth can do? Nothing. But we claim completely different than what God claims. What are you talking about? I'm not dust of the earth. I'm a man with power, authority. I can do everything. Look at what we have accomplished. Animal cannot do what, what the man had done. We're not the same as animal. Look at all the animals. There's no civilization. There's no formal language. There's no technology. We're not the same as animal. Human is different. You heard of Renaissance. 
right? What is a renaissance? A renaissance is exactly that. Man is more important than, a, than God. Man has a power. Man has authority. Man has, you know, ability to do anything. That's a renaissance. Man can do everything. And look what we have accomplished over the years. We have advanced so much. But you know what? Humans are full that eventually we will destroy ourselves. That's who we are. Even though we think we're very, very smart, but you know what? We're building something that destroys ourselves. Just one thing, we just see ourselves. What do we have accomplished? We advanced a lot of things to really just cure. Medical technology helps us to really just to cure from all kinds of disease. Great. But you know what? What have we done? We're the one who created the viruses. We're the one who created all these bad things, what we eat. Right? Now, what do we do? Whatever we created will destroy us. Whatever we did was actually destroyed our nature. And now what we are ended up is literally we see this all kinds of weird weathers that we see in today's world. Everywhere. Drought, rains, storms. Isn't this actually the weird weathers that we actually see all this time? Who created this? God created this or the man created this? Man created this. We're the one who actually did all this. And eventually, I will tell you, the man will destroy ourselves. The most genius, the man we claim ourselves, we are smart and intelligent, is the one who's going to, create, uh, to destroy the civilization. That's how smart we are to destroy ourselves. But that's, Bible is teaching us. Who are you? You think you claim you're very intelligent, wise, smart. You are dust of the earth. That's who you are. Nothing. Well, just keep that in mind, verse 20. Just put an underline. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward, and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth? So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in, the, in his work, for that is his lot, who can bring him to see what will be after him. Do you think the people come after Solomon's day was any different? It's exactly the same. What was done is done today and will be done in the future. That's how smart we are. We just repeat the same things over and over and over. We just don't learn from the past. Unfortunately, that's reality. But for people who really reads and understands and keep it in our heart, we learn something from the Bible. And God teaches us. But whoever ignores it, unfortunately, that's your decision. Whoever keeps it and understands and try to live a different life, well, bless them as well. But whether we take it or not, God literally laid this down before us. It's like, here's the life, here's the death. You choose. It's your choice. Jesus Christ died for us. When you choose Jesus Christ, you will live. If you abandon and disobey Jesus, well, you will be destroyed. It's your choice. Jesus died for all. But the choice is us. Whether we choose Jesus or deny Jesus, it is up to us. God is a living us of decisions to make. And we as a man have all the choices that we can make with the free wills that we have 
you can exercise your free will to choose what God told us versus what God told not to do. It's us. Just like God gave to Adam. Here's the tree of life and tree of knowledge. You can eat anything except this fruits from the tree of knowledge. God did not force him to, to take the fruit from the tree of knowledge. It's yours. I lay this down. You choose whether you accept my word and obey it or you deny it and do what you want. It's exactly the same. The options, it was a given to us. The choices we make, it determines whether we live, whether we actually perish. And I hope everyone makes the right decision. Only thing I can say is, this is what the Bible says, and I shared and interpreted what, is, what it said, but the decision is up to every one of us. You choose. Well, we'll cover up to this point, and we'll continue on uh, chapter 4 next week.